Thanks for joining us during the six hour webathon, broadcasting live from Jerusalem, focusing on raising temple consciousness by exploring the biblical, historical, contemporary, and political issues surrounding the Temple Mount, the holiest site in the world. Hello, Richmond and Frankie Snyder, senior staff members of the Temple Mount Sifting Project in Jerusalem, are about to lead us on an archaeological exploration of the exciting Temple Mount and Holy Temple-related discoveries of the past year. Both Frankie and Hillel have personal hands-on involvement with these discoveries, the most significant archaeological finds from the Temple Mount to date. Hillel and Frankie will be sharing with us their insights and experiences. We're back here in the studio, third International Temple Mount Awareness Day. Did I say annual? I think I forgot that. And uh, we just had a great time listening to the band, beautiful music, raised our spirits. And I'm uh, feeling really good right now because I have two very special guests and I get to be the lone host. So I don't have to share the hosting with anyone. Um, and it's a privilege to be with these people because we've been talking all evening about uh, perseverance and patience and uh, getting our hands dirty. And now we're with a couple of people who really do get their hands dirty. Um, we're with uh, Frankie Snyder and Hillel Richmond from the Temple Mount Sifting Project. Hillel is, a, is the senior staff member of the project and, and Frankie is a guide, English language guide. Um, we're going to talk about some exciting finds that we've you've discovered over the past year and um, about your own personal experiences and inspirations. The archaeological discoveries are something that everybody really just goes over the moon about. I mean, I don't know why, but we all love it. A tiny little something, which is really a little nothing, but it's 2,000 years old. It came from the Holy Temple, and, and even the most cynical journalists are all aglow about it. Um, but first, I'd like to hear from you, describe, us, uh, describe to us what the Sifting Project is. The Temple Mount Sifting Project got started in the fall of 2004. Our archaeologists are uh, Professor Gabi Barkai of uh, Bar Ilan University and Zaki Tavira. Uh, um, this project got started as a result of the actions of the Waqf and the Muslim community up on the Temple Mount. They engaged in a an illegal dig, illegal construction work up on the Temple Mount, and part of that in included removing from the Temple Mount several hundreds of truckloads mm -hmm. of earth rich with artifacts um, that represented the history of Jews, of Christians, and of Muslims from off of the Temple Mount, and it was dumped unceremoniously in the, an illegal dump in the Kidron Valley. Mm -hmm. These archaeologists uh, secured the material from the Antiquities Authority and moved it to the uh, Emic Zareen Park, which is only about a kilometer away. Mm -hmm. And this is where the sifting project began. The project's been running now about seven years. We've had over 100,000 people help us with this project, and the project will continue for, for more years to come. How many years have you been with the project? I've been you? with the project now for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And you, Hillel? I've been uh, six and a half years now. So you really are the senior staff member. Uh, you can say that. So your hands have seen a lot of dirt. Yes, very much so. And you probably see more dirt than anything else. Yes. Um, there's a question I've had for a long time. How do you know when you're going through this dirt and, and you must find a lot of little things that are nothing? Am I, am I correct? It's not that they're nothing. It's just that some things are not as important as the individual object, but statistically, uh, even the small things are very important. Even, I mean, sometimes you must just find pebbles or something that was dumped there 10 years ago and not oh, yeah. 2,000 years ago. Do you have a, an intuition when, when something, because I imagine, tell me if I'm wrong, I imagine that when you first pull something out, it doesn't look like anything because it's been covered in dirt for 2,000 years. Do you have an intuition that you're onto something? Uh, well, uh, after you've washed the material with water, uh, you basically can see all the colors and you can see what you're looking at. So uh, sometimes, sometimes you'll have an intuition if there's something in a particular bucket. Like uh, me and Frankie have had a, 
had cases where we feel there's a coin in the bucket and they'll actually mm -hmm. be there. But uh, generally, uh, once you wash the material and when you have the, the uh, experienced eye, you can spot it right away. It uh, just hits you in the face. So when there's something uh, very important, unless it's just hiding underneath something, some other mm -hmm. artifact, yeah. some, something else. But, uh, so every little piece of anything that might be something you, you wash in the water? We wash an entire bucket load mm -hmm. every time. We mm -hmm. wash the, the whole I bucket, see. we spread it all in front of, in front of us, and uh, we wash it off, and you can see all the different colors and uh, artifacts uh, sort of right like there. Sort of like for gold. Uh, very much so. Very much so. And how often do you, does something turn up that is noteworthy? Well, it's not so much that it's noteworthy, but every single bucket has artifacts in it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that our material came to us not in situ, meaning it wasn't in uh, a layer. So our buckets are totally jumbled up with 3,000 years worth of material mm -hmm. in each bucket. Sounds and like so, my kids yeah, and there's, there's things in every bucket. There must be between 10 wow. and 30 objects in every bucket that we're pulling out to save, to, to look through, uh, you know, as, as archaeologists to look through the material. So you're, so you're, you're telling me that you said there were hundreds of, hundreds of truckloads yes. of debris. Yes. So that must be thousands of tons. Yes. And so you're talking about hundreds of thousands of buckets. Yes. And every bucket has something. Yes, absolutely wow. every bucket. Wow, so you really are the personification of patience and persistence. Mm -hmm. And of course that I think has turned into the theme for the evening because as we progress toward the rebuilding of the Holy Temple, all of our guests are stressing that, you know, things are moving along, we're on the right track, we just have to continue doing what we're doing, doing it better, being persistent and being patient because we all know it's not going to happen by itself. So why do you suppose there's something so romantic and enticing about archaeological artifacts? What do you attribute that to? Why does the public love? Well, I think uh, people are fascinated with reality and um, this, allow this allows you to actually um, witness the reality uh, as it's happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, gives you a real hands-on uh, history, so to say, so to speak. And um, you know, usually when people, you know, you go to a museum and you see you see artifacts that have been already found, and here you're actually uh, uh, making history. You're actually the one finding the artifact. Mm -hmm. uh, so it gives you a real, uh, you know, a real perspective on, on the history. So people like me, we do a lot of talk, and it may be inspiring. But the fact is that you really are pulling these nuggets out of the dirt and are bringing back not just a memory of the Beit HaMikdash, of the Holy Temple, but a reality from the Holy Temple. We, there were some fascinating finds this past year, which we're going to talk about a little later. Um, you guys deal with remnants from the Temple Mount all the time. Have you been to the Temple Mount? Once or twice. Once or twice, Frankie? <laughs> Uh, since I'm a, a licensed tour guide, that mm -hmm. is actually my specialty, mm -hmm. and so I've been up there many times. But of course, the the time that you remember is always the first time that you go. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I went to the Temple Mount was only about two weeks after I arrived, after I made Aliyah. It was about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I went up with a couple friends. We had no expectations as to what might happen up there. But as I was standing, staring at the dome of the rock, mm -hmm. suddenly saw above it a transparent column that ascended up into heavens. Wow. Um, and as I stand, stood there looking at it, I was sort of questioning, what is that? Um, later, I talked to a friend of mine who was a Zohar scholar. Mm -hmm. His name is uh, Abraham Leder. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if he knew anything about a column ascending from the place where the, the temple had stood. And so he showed me in the Zohar several texts that we learned together. And they talked about an omud, mm -hmm. uh, a column right. that rose from the Holy of Holies and rose up through the seven levels of heaven, through the seven hekalot. Um, and I learned that the purpose of this column was to carry in it, to be like a, an elevator shaft, and to carry the prayers of the people mm -hmm. up heavenward and also to carry souls up and down through this column. That's in the Zohar. That's, that's in the Zohar. Mm -hmm. Something else I learned in there was that the name of the seventh level of heaven is Makor Haim. Mm -hmm. Now what is very ironic now is that I actually live on Makor Haim Street uh -huh. 
in the neighborhood of Makor Haim. In Jerusalem. And of course, I live in apartment number seven. Wow. So um, even my address is a constant reminder of uh, the centrality of the Temple Mount in my life. Now this amud that is there, this column mm -hmm. that exists there, this is the one of the reasons that all Jews around the world turn and face Jerusalem when they pray. The people in Jerusalem turn to the right. Temple Mount, and people who are in and around, around the city, you know, we're turning to the Temple Mount, but specifically towards the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. because we're facing this amud. We're sending our right. prayers our up heavenward yeah. through, through, this, through this column that's there. Right. And so, so let me ask you, does, does uh, the archaeological work that you, you do, it must have a very spiritual meaning for you. It's very, it's very spiritual. And for the people who come there, it gives them a real spiritual connection to it. There is, um, in Psalm 102, mm -hmm. a verse that we give everyone when they leave the project, that uh, we get, hand them a, a certificate. And on there, there, there is this verse. You will surely arise and take pity on Zion, for it is time to be gracious to her. The appointed time has come. Your servant shall delight in her stones and cherish her dust. Mm -hmm. And the people who come there love the stones and, and the, the dust, dust. Yeah. and they work there in the stones and the, and the dust. You're mentioning the people that come. Could you just quickly describe, are these are volunteers that, uh, that come from around the world? They are from around the world. There are local school children from here. Mm -hmm. We have uh, military groups from here who come, but lots and lots of tourists, a lot from Europe. I find myself continually giving translated tours for um, Hungarian groups, mm. but we have groups from all over the world, the United States. We have bar mitzvah groups that come there, or bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah groups. Um, we have college students that come um, every age, every size. We have two and three year olds that we put up on, on little step stools uh -huh. and they're up there and they're sifting. And everybody comes to work. Everybody comes to work, and get their so, hands dirty. Right, and so people need a little bit of a training ahead of time, a little instruction? Well, we give them about a, a half an hour program first on the history of the Temple Mount and the history of the project. And I show them lots of different pictures of different kind of artifacts that we find. Mm -hmm. And then we literally give them a five minute demonstration on this is how you're going to sift. You're going to take the bucket, pour it on the tray, spray out the bucket, take the water hose, wash off everything on the tray. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they say is, oh, look at the colors. And we go, yeah, you wash off the mud and all of a sudden the <laughs> colors pop through. And like Hillel said before, once you watch it, everything mm -hmm. just pops out. Wow. You can see all the different colors and all the different objects that are on the tray. And, and you're finding things from all different periods. Yes, yes. The buckets are totally mixed up. They're in the bucket, there can be something that's from 50 years ago, something that's from 3,000 years mm -hmm. ago in the same bucket. You found made discoveries from the first temple period? Yes, and when we find pottery, the pottery especially from the first temple period, mm -hmm. when we find that, lots of times, and we know how to recognize it, so we'll tell somebody, oh, this is a piece of pottery from the first temple period. It's between 2,500 and 3,000 years old, and they'll say, oh, I bet King Solomon ate off of that plate. Mm -hmm. It's that reality yeah that we can put into it, that they can put into it, that says to them, I'm doing something really important here. And what we're finding here is very important. So they're helping you do the dirty work. Yes. And they're getting an education and a, and a connection to the Holy Temple via the discoveries that, that they're helping to, to make. And, and you're telling me that anybody from around the world could at any moment discover the most precious find discovered to date could happen to anyone, couldn't it, Hillel? Even to the most veteran staff member. So you're sifting and these things are coming alive. Mm -hmm. um, let's begin to discuss some of the things that this past year, there were some very sensational discoveries. Not, I don't know if they all were at the sifting project, but you're in the archeological world but they all were connected to the Holy Temple. So maybe, Frankie, you could begin and, and talk about some of the things that have been discovered this past year. One of the mar remarkable things that, that was found um, that was in some material that came from, um, from the city of David mm -hmm. was a small bell. Mm -hmm. But before I explain that, I need to explain the area that this came from. Okay. In ancient times, in Second Temple period times, there was a beautiful walkway that went along the entire western wall of the temple, mm -hmm. of the Temple Mount, 
it proceeded down through the city of David and went all the way down to the Siloam pool, or mm -hmm. the uh, Shiloh pool that's all the way down at the bottom of the hill. And under this walkway was a rain drain pipe. Mm -hmm. It was to take the, the a drain water, yeah, a gutter, that, well, but it's underneath. It's right. a, like a, a, mm -hmm. uh, a tunnelway that goes underneath. And along the, this walkway at intervals, there were drains, you know, a large stone that has slits cut in it, and the water would drain down there right. from the rain. And if someone dropped something, it might fall down in there. Mm -hmm. Or if the rain washed things down the street, they would go down into the drain. And down in the drain, they built up layers of dirt over many years. And this has been the source of some great finds this year. This is an archaeological, pro archaeological project headed up by Ellie Shukran and Professor Ronnie Reich from Haifa University. Mm -hmm. And they, when they first started digging through this drain, they decided that this might be very valuable soil. So they decided that they were going to take all of it and send it out to the sifting project mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a contract for the staff uh -huh. out there to sift because we have the, the facilities to do it. And this bell was something that was found there. It is a small golden bell, only about this size. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be something that was possibly sewn onto someone's clothing. It has a little... Uh, has a little tiny mm, loop, at loop the very, it, yeah. tiny little loop at the very top of it. Would have been sewn onto someone's clothing. It comes from the Second Temple period. Mm -hmm. Someone in authority, someone who had the means to be able to afford something like that, was walking down the street near the Robinson's Arch area. It fell off their clothes, it fell down the drain, right. and it fell into the soil and it was recovered this year. Wow, now, if anybody's missing a, a gold bell from 2,000 years ago, we have it. How, it it's, it's actually, it doesn't look like a, a bell as we picture it today. Not, not a little jingly bell like right. this, but it was closed, more mm -hmm. like a closed clamshell with a little little piece of metal so in there. So somebody had to shake, shake it to discover that it yeah, was a bell. If it, but if it weren't or on your clothes and you were walking along, it would jingle. But I mean, when, when you discovered it, someone had to pick it up and shake it. So let me pick it up and shake it to and realize to that, that, it it, that it was actually wow. a bell. Yeah. yeah, We know that the high priest mm -hmm. wore bells on his clothing. Um, it says in the book of Exodus, you shall make the robe of the ephod of pure blue, and on its hem make pomegranates of blue, purple, and crimson yarn all the way around the hem, with bells of gold between them all around a gold bell and a pomegranate, and a gold bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe. And Aaron shall wear it while officiating so that the sound of it is heard when he comes into the sanctuary before the Lord. And now I think we can actually hear this bell. Wow. That's a bell from 2000, at least 2,000 years at ago. At least 2,000 years and ago. And of course, on the hem of the high priest, there were, according to our tradition, 72 of these bells. Mm -hmm. So this is a very quiet sound, but you can imagine a 72 of these. W this was a very lightweight bell? Uh, yes, rather lightweight, because you've got to be able to... Uh, the, the gold is going to be thin. It's mm -hmm. not going to be really thick, so it's not going to be a heavy bell. Right. You've got 72 of them around, plus right. all the little, right. little woven pomegranates. Um, so they, they can't be too heavy to have the high priest wearing so this around. So there's a, a good reason to believe that this might be a bell actually from the, from the hem of the, of the tunic of the high priest. It may very well be. There is no way to know for sure. Is there any but it's a great evidence that people wore bells on their, on their garments for decoration other than the, the high priest? This is is the only, personally, this is the only place I've seen where mm -hmm. someone is wearing a bell on their garment for decoration. So archaeologists uh, tend to be a little cautious. They're not going well, we to say for sure. Well, yeah, we, we have yeah. to be cautious. So we can't say, you know, yes, the high priest wore this. But, but we can say, you know, it's very much within the realm of possibility because this, this is the person who wore a garment with a bell. Mm -hmm. And uh, he must have been looking for it for a long time. The next morning when he counted the bells, one was missing. One was missing, yes. Of course, this was some, a reality of the, of the holy temple, and there were always spare parts. Um, and spare garments so that uh, in a case like this uh, it could be remedied rather quickly mm -hmm. but um, still he must have wondered where it went to and we found it 2,000 years later. We're talking with Frankie Snyder and Hillel Richmond from the Temple Mount Sifting Project 
This is a very fascinating discussion, and we're going to be right back. We're just going to take a quick break. Shalom, we're back with Frankie Snyder and Hillel Richmond from the Temple Mount Sifting Project. And we've been talking about new discoveries of ancient things. And the fact that these little things that we find in the earth from the Holy Temple, from the soil of the Holy Temple, make it alive, really bring it back for, obviously for the people discovering them, but also for the world. These are, these are fascinating discoveries. We just talked about the, the golden bell that we have no reason to believe that it's not from the hem of the high priest, who along the hem, as we just read, of his tunic had 72 golden bells interspersed with 72 uh, pomegranates of, of purple and blue and red thread. And uh, what other things have we discovered this past year? Twice now we have found things that have menorahs on them. Uh, one of the main objects that was in the the main space inside mm -hmm. the, in the inside the temple uh -huh. was the seven branch menorah, and this evidently was used as a motif quite often. And twice this year, we have actually found this things with with this uh, mm -hmm. menorah on it. The first one was found down in Akko. We're just outside of Akko in a little village named Uza. Akko, which is in the northern coast. It's um, along Israel. the along yeah. the coast. And there they found a bread stamp. Now, it's a, a small a thing for, for stamping bread. Um, if a baker was baking the bread, he wanted to show that it, it was kosher. Mm -hmm. he, he had a little stamp to stamp it. And the it's symbol the on it we found for, uh, for the Jews was a menorah. Now, the majority of the, the stamps that they find have a cross on them. Now, mm -hmm. these are from the Byzantine period. Mm -hmm. The excavations there are being done by uh, archaeologist um, Gilad Jaffe and um, Dr. Danny Sion, and what they found was a stamp that had mm -hmm. a menorah on it. Now, this stamp was made by a, by a potter. It's made out of clay, and when the potter would make it, he would form it with one flat side and put a picture on it. For mm -hmm. the Christians, it was a cross. For, for the Jews, it was a menorah. And then, once he baked it in the oven, and now the stamp is hard so that the baker can use it, each baker will then inscribe his name on the top side mm -hmm. of it so that the stamp would actually be used twice. Before the baker put the bread into the oven, he would put the stamp on it, and the menorah meant this bread is kosher. Mm -hmm. And then he would turn the stamp over, stamp it with his name on the other side, uh -huh. and it was baked by, in the, this case, uh -huh. a, guy, a guy named Lantius, who is the name that is on there. They've actually found his name on, on other stamps also. And this, this actually this particular stamp existed first a few hundred years, it sounds, after the destruction of the Second Temple. Yes, this, well, this was during the Byzantine period. Mm -hmm. So it was in the, in the sixth century. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in Akko at the time, it was largely a Christian community, but they have found different remnants of a Jewish community there. And so this has been very helpful in establishing that over in this little village of Uza that's just outside of Akko, there was a Jewish community, and mm -hmm. there was a Jewish baker there, and evidently he probably sent his bread on in to be sold in Akko also. Right. So we're not the first generation of Jews that have been persistent and patient and have refused to forget and to give up on, on the Holy Temple. Exactly. Even back then, and certainly back then, um, the, the Holy Temple was, was always being kept alive in, in every way. Um, you mentioned a second uh, menorah. A second one. This was actually found <coughs> near this channel that we talked about before, the mm -hmm. drainage channel that goes from near the Temple Mount all the way down to the Siloam Pool. Near there was found a stone about this size, mm -hmm. and on it someone had taken a sharp implement, probably like a spike, and had drawn on it a menorah. Now, he only got as far as, drive, as drawing the uh, five, mm -hmm. uh, five branches on the top, but what is important, um, Dr. Ronnie Reich, who's the archaeologist with us, he said that one of the main things about it is the way that he shows that there is a base on mm -hmm. this menorah and then like with, with feet underneath it. The menorah from the temple evidently did not have just a straight base coming down and a little flat right. piece on it. It has some kind of a base around it with legs on it, and this is what's symbolized on here. And Dr. Reich thinks this is the, one, of the main, uh, one of the important things about this mm -hmm. is how this is symbolized. And three times a year in the Holy Temple, uh, during the festivals, 
uh, at one point, these implements, which were in the sanctuary, mm -hmm. in the Kodesh, the menorah and the, the um, table of the, of the showbread and also the golden um, altar were brought out by the priests so that the public at large could see them. Yes, so this is evidently someone who had been up there, mm -hmm. saw it, and yeah. when he came back, he was just doodling mm -hmm. and he, he drew his impression of it. Wow. It was just on a small stone, yeah. probably got tossed aside, and now 2,000 years later, it's going to be in a museum. Uh, yeah, his doodles, an, an he ancient, has no idea. An ancient etch 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 <laughs> Um So now we're leading up to the piece de resistance, really, I think, the most exciting discovery of this past year. And um, hello, maybe you'd like to talk about it. Um, well, essentially, what I found was a, uh, a stamp, a stamp piece of clay, about two centimeters in diameter. Mm -hmm which is um, an object uh, that was part of the service in the Holy Temple. Mm -hmm. um, what it is, is a basically, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, frankly? Uh, a token. A token of purchase, a mm -hmm. token of purchase. Proof of purchase. Proof of purchase. Uh, after you've uh, sacrificed your, your sacrifice, you would give a libation. Mm -hmm. And you would go to this uh, room, this chamber of seals, Right. Uh, you would pay for your libations, and you would receive this token. Uh, this is all uh, bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Then you'd have to go to another uh, station and show them the proof of purchase uh, that you found. Right. That you, sorry, that, you that, you, uh, that I found. That you received. You found it. I found it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you would get the, the libation uh, in order to, uh, to offer mm -hmm. it. So uh, uh, this is the first time that anything like this has ever been found. Uh, Obviously, a very uh, significant find. What's uh, what's written on the stamp? Well, uh, according to the uh, um, press release, it says on it in Aramaic, "Dacha mm -hmm. Lahashem," uh, mm -hmm. which means "pure for God," mm -hmm. which is slightly different than uh, the Mishnah, which specifies uh, uh, about these uh, about about this exact subject. Uh, according to the Mishnah. Uh, uh, we don't find this exact uh, uh, this exact uh, uh, wording. wording, but it's something of, of the sort, something like this that we didn't really know existed. So, so before you continue, what you're telling me is that you made this discovery uh, of this stamp, tiny little stamp, and it has these words written on it, and then did you realize right away that this is what it was? How did you make the connection to this um, and the Mishnah? I realized that this is something from the temple. Uh, first of all, because you don't, I've been, I've been doing this for quite a long time, mm -hmm. you don't really, you don't find these things. Um, occasionally we'll find, uh, from other, uh, other layers, we'll find a uh, stamped piece of clay, uh, aka bua, mm -hmm. uh, with f uh, first temple period uh, ancient Hebrew writing, which is mm -hmm. very different than the, uh, the Hebrew writing that this, uh, uh -huh. this uh, seal clay uh, was written with. Um, but, uh, We've never found anything like this, and I, uh, so this is the first time ever. Uh, so I realize that this is obviously very important. Also, uh, the, the, the area where this was taken from was very, very close uh, to the temple. Wow. And uh, I knew it, so uh, Your hand pretty shaking? exciting. Hmm? Your hand shaking when you, when you found it? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew, even before you cleaned it off, you knew something was happening? Uh, I saw it right away. It was the first thing that, uh, that I saw. Uh -huh. so and at first I thought this. that somebody was uh, perhaps p uh, playing a practical joke on me Whoa. because it was uh, just so uh, cartoonish in its perfection. Wow. So at what point did you realize that this was the seal that the Mishnah, can you tell us which, which Mishnah? Uh, we're talking about the Mishnah in Shkalim. Uh, there are a few different uh, uh, Mishnayot that deal with this. Uh, the first one is, uh, it just specifies the different officers that were ser that served in the temple. And it says here, these are the officers who were served in the temple. Uh, Jonathan, uh, sorry, uh, Johanan, son of Pinchas, was over the seals. And then it specifies here exactly what these seals were. If any wished for, uh, for drink offerings, he would go to Johanan, who was over the seals, and give him money and receive from, uh, from him a seal. He would then go to uh, Ahiyah, who was over the drink offerings, and give him the seal uh, from him. Receive drink offerings. Uh, and then we have another interesting uh, mission here, mm -hmm. and it says here, if a man lost his seal, they made him wait until evening. If they found uh, money left over, enough for his seal, they gave him the seal, but if they did not find enough, he, he received none. 
Uh, well, uh, uh, somebody lost a seal. Somebody <laughs> lost a seal. And I found it. And somebody found 2, it. 2,000 years late. So if anybody can positively identify that seal, then uh, maybe we can make a deal to get it back. And you can do your libation offering after 2,000 years, something that we all want to do. Um, Hello. You're describing here is very fascinating because this little tiny piece that you discovered opens up a world of the Holy Temple, which wasn't just the altar and it wasn't just the sanctuary. It really was, like you said before, a whole bureaucracy, you know, in the positive sense of the word, uh, word I would like to say, if there is a positive sense to bureaucracy, where there, the, the Holy Temple was really um, a complex of, of many different offices and chambers where everything took place specific to different things that were happening. And so this little seal shed light upon part of this system. Um, so a person would go up, and it wasn't so simple. Uh, you didn't just go and hand your stuff to the Kohen and, and say, OK, do it. You had to follow certain, certain rules. So, 2,000 years later, you found this guy's seal, which was lost, or when the destruction of the temple occurred, was you know, tossed with everything else. Um, that's got to do something to you. Uh, frankly, it's uh, quite mind-boggling, <laughs> the thought of it. Explain. Um, well, to be able to uh, dig something up that uh, is 2,000 years old, and it's got on it Hebrew letters that you and I can uh, read. Mm -hmm. It's quite, uh, quite something. So I understand you really become the poster boy, literally, for the Temple Mount Sifting Project because there are bigger than life-size posters of you in particular on the walls of uh, Ir David, the city of David right now. Did you have to mention that? <laughs> I had to mention <laughs> that. So it's not just because of your good work. I imagine it's because of your good looks as well that they chose you. So this little clay seal, Frankie, what, wh what do you have to, you didn't discover it, but you were right there. It's so interesting when we find things like this. Mm -hmm. Like Hillel said, you know, when we wash the things off on the tray, if there's something really different on there, you see it immediately. And like I said, he saw it right away. You see these objects and they really just jump out at you. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is something really different and it obviously is very, very special. And when you, when you get lucky buckets, we call them lucky buckets, when you get a lucky bucket <laughs> like that and you, you put everything on the tray, you wash off the mud and all of a sudden something jumps out at you, you can hear people screaming all over the place, you know, I've got to find something here because it's just mm -hmm. so, so exceptional when you, when you see those objects. And the archaeologists who supervise, they're on location at all times? Or did you have to make a phone call and say, get here right away? Uh, there are several archaeologists. There's an uh, archaeologist from our project that's uh, mm -hmm. in charge uh, uh, on the spot. Uh, but we, he immediately uh, made a phone call, and uh, Eli Shukwan got down there, and I can tell he was very excited, and uh, mm -hmm. he made some phone calls, and uh, the rest is history. The rest is history, and now you're part of history. You can't deny that. So the Temple Mount Sifting Project really is making history by rediscovering history. And it's ironic because, as, as you mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, all this came about because of the Muslim attempt to destroy history and to eradicate our connection to the, to the Temple Mount and the Holy Temple. But in their zest to destroy our history, we are rediscovering it, um, which is a phenomenal and a sign, I think, of, of the approaching changes in, in, in what's happening in the world. Before we conclude, I know, Frankie, I wanted to ask you this question. You discovered a lot of things some important things, some exciting things. If you could discover anything, what would it be? We could reach down and get a book first, <laughs> and then I'll answer your question. Uh, we all would, lo would love to find the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but on a more practical level, mm. there are things that we just might run into if we are aware of what to watch for. And one time, I was actually reading through Josephus, mm -hmm. looking specifically for um, what, what might I look for? What do I need to keep my eye out for? As I was reading through, in one place I found a description of the temple. Okay? But this temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance, like a mountain covered with snow. 
For as for those parts that were not gilt, those were not covered with gold, mm -hmm. they were exceedingly white. And on its top, it had spikes with sharp points to prevent any pollution of it by birds sitting upon it. Mm -hmm. So around the top of the temple, there were these spikes that right. were right at the top edge. Um, and they kept birds from landing on the corner and soiling mm -hmm. the side of the they building. They the same thing today, but they're made of plastic. Yeah, you know, right. For your windows. This was made out of spikes, and they were coated with gold. Now, the first time I read that, I thought, okay, that's interesting. But then about 30 pages farther back, the topic of the spikes came up again. And this was in the context of when the Romans broke out onto the Temple Mount. Nor can one imagine either a greater or more terrible noise than this, for there was at once a great shout from the Roman legions who were marching all together. And then it drops down a few lines more, and it says, As for the priests, some of them plucked up from the holy house the spikes that were on it mm -hmm. with their bases, and these were made of lead. And they shot them down at the Romans instead of darts. But then, as they gained nothing by doing this, and the fire burst out upon them, they retired from that area. So, Frankie, so, Frankie's wish, dream, is to discover these well, spikes. Well, these spikes, the spikes that, that were sitting the, on top of the, right. of the temple that stayed there would have melted in the fire. Mm -hmm. But these other ones that were taken, they were thrown down out right. and away from the temple. Maybe one of those was Maybe preserved. someday. Maybe we'll have someday. to find a spike out of lead with little flecks of gold on it that says, mm -hmm. this was once on the very top wow. of the temple mount. Wow. It's been wonderful talking to you. This is a fascinating subject. And keep up the good work. Thank you. And keep discovering things. And maybe we'll find those spikes one day. Um, this is, again, the third annual uh, International Temple Mount Awareness Day program. And we thank you all for being with us. We have much more to go. We're not over yet. We'd like to thank our our uh, sponsors, especially our main supporter in this affair, which is the Schrader Family of America, and all the sponsors who have been sending in and calling in their sponsorships uh, before and throughout the program. To make a sponsorship, you can either go to templeinstitute.org, you can do it via PayPal, you can do it via credit card, you can do it via check, you can do it via money order. Or you can call our toll-free number, which is 1-800-940-9121 and uh, support the work of the Temple Institute and the work really of everybody who spends their days and nights in making the Holy Temple a reality today and a reali reality for tomorrow. Haiti <laughs>